nice to see everybody's face and um, I'm nice to have an opportunity uh, to engage in what I hope to be a rich discussion after I spend a little time giving some background. Um, before I start too, I want to acknowledge uh, Happy New Year and the Jewish tradition. We're well over 5,000 years and, um, and counting. And so uh, Happy Jewish New Year to everybody. Um, I will be talking about my experience a little bit. Uh, I'm, this is a two-part series. Uh, they're not necessarily connected in a way that requires you to do one end or the other to do either one, but Today, I'm going to focus more on what I call being an engaged citizen and the more general responsibility we all each have, in my opinion. Um, and speaking in my opinion, everything I say now and everything I'll be saying for the rest of this time, and of course, throughout my whole life, is just a representation of my opinions. And speaking of opinions, I love the quote that, that uh, Roshi Agyoku from ZCLA put in the article she had in, called Hold for the Center in the Tricycle Magazine from uh, our teacher, Bernie Glassman's teacher, Meizumi Roshi. She said, he often said to her, I don't ask you to give up your ideas, but at least set them aside for a while. You can always pick them up later. So let's start off with that kind of intention. And to dive into this, I think uh, I, I want to read the statement that we did post, but I think it warrants uh, reflecting again together on this, the statement that ZPI put out at the end of, right after the 2016 election, that was really crafted by Bernie and, and really represents his view of the one body and all of its manifestations. The recent election in the United States has had a deep impact, not just on Americans, but on many around the world. It has stoked shock, fear, upset, and anger in many, and relief, hope, and gladness in others. The big difference is how we feel, the big, big differences in how we feel reflect the diversity of people, their karmas, values, and vision. That difference is no problem. Holding these differences while seeking common ground and taking action is the challenge facing us now. This is the best time to invoke the three tenets and bring forth the, the mind of not knowing, bearing witness, and a response grounded in those, two, in those tenets. Rather than knowing what to fear and expect, which sows fears of confusion, outrage, and victimhood, let's cultivate not knowing, letting go of preconceptions and certainties. Please use whatever practice grounds you in this space, be it meditation, mindfulness, ceremony, or prayer. Bear witness to what arises, both outside and inside, and then honor the response that naturally comes forth, forth from this present moment. Four years later, the U.S. is even more polarized, in my opinion. And so um, I find that it's important to look at politics, and can politics be part of our spiritual practice? And it's interesting because... <laughs> Duality defines the relative reality, and in Buddhism we speak of the relative reality and the absolute reality. Duality is what defines the relative reality, but that duality is not always easy to see. But in politics, the poles are in stark contrast. This duality is in our face every day, and it should be easy to see, but yet it escapes us. It escapes our awareness. Um, I do want to talk about the irony of speaking of the duality of the relative and then the absolute reality in contrast to the relative reality and that itself is a duality isn't it so let's let's remember that that is our way of expressing that challenge and only by bringing those two together which i think is addressed so well in many sutras but the one that comes to mind is the heart sutra where we don't really have words that can describe what that is when those are brought together, but we can sort of point to it. So I did want to acknowledge that. Um, and politics, you know, there's uh, a bumper sticker that I remember seeing, I see in the South a lot, I don't see here in Colorado much, but occasionally, which is what would Christ do? So I'll turn that around a little bit and ask, what would Buddha do in these days? 
And it's interesting, I had a chance to spend a lot of time with Stephen Batchelor on a pilgrimage in India, going through the different points of areas of Buddha's life. And he was working on, the on a book at the time about the actual history of Buddha's life. And it, it turns out, and I can't, I, I don't remember, I don't think he actually wrote a book just on that, but in several of his books, he makes reference to it. To it. But the Buddha actually spent time negotiating between kingdoms. There were a lot of kingdoms in that, in that area of the world, and he was actually engaged in politics, uh, recognizing that reality was a necessary way uh, of uh, working towards reducing suffering. And for me, until 2013, I was a, a committed, apolitical, politically agnostic person. Uh, to be honest, the system disgusted me. I'm not proud to say that, but I'm just recognizing that was my view. I went about my life uh, certainly with different ideas about politicians and things, but I, uh, while I voted every election, I, I always took that as a responsibility. I didn't really take any, didn't have a sense of being, uh, uh, carrying a responsibility as a citizen. I just went through my life, you know, trying to advance my career and collect my toys and, um, and, and do the, and do the thing that we do when we're just living our householder lives. And I want to shift now just to uh, back to Bernie for a second and remind us all that he, he gave us a very important perspective, I think, in terms of distilling down uh, the, the multitude of commentaries and things and teachings in the Dharma uh, to uh, the essence of what is enlightenment for him. And he described enlightenment as the recognition of the one body, recognition of our uh, interbeing, our interconnectedness with all. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Scotland calls. Um, and we he, he would describe it that we have different layers and we can develop a deeper levels of enlightenment as we recognize that one body. And his first example is one I think we can all identify with this, which is we can recognize our own one body. We can see our right hand and our left hand are different, but they're all part of the same body. And our left hand doesn't think, oh, if my right hand gets cut, oh, I'm going to be a great person. Look at me. I'm compassionate. I'm going to take care of that right hand and should not be held in uh, high esteem because I'm being helpful. No, it doesn't think about it. It just recognizes the oneness and just deals with it in that the sense that sort of describes love, true love, connects, heals, does the best it can. And, and Bernie would describe, we all have that level of enlightenment, pretty much. If we didn't have that level of enlightenment, that's sort of one of the definitions of being deluded or being a little bit mentally unstable if you didn't recognize your own one body. The trick is to step past that and recognize that true interconnectedness, that we are all part of the same body. Republicans, Democrats, progressives, socialists, um, libertarians, all part of the same body. And his teaching of uh, distill this down into a practice that I think is critical and has been for all of us, but particularly very helpful, I mean, uniquely helpful for me in terms of the practice I've had in, in walking the halls of Congress and in engaging local uh, leaders and, um, uh, and dealing with my fellow citizens. And that is use of the three tenets. And I know some of you are very familiar with this and some aren't, but to repeat what was said in the election statement that I read earlier, the three tenets are bearing witness, not knowing, and taking action. And the, the not knowing and the bearing witness and the taking action can be, can be uh, well, they have to be in terms of how we language things, but they're presented in a linear way, but that's not how they operate. Not knowing doesn't mean you have no knowledge, of course, not knowing only means that you uh, don't bring your experience and knowledge in front of your face as a way to perceive what is going on and therefore interferes with your ability to truly bear witness to what's going on. 
because only if you can really see what's going on without uh, filtering it through your expectations of what the problem is or ought to be or how it can be solved, then you can't really find the best path to reduce the suffering, to address the problem, to enhance the happiness that might be the opportunity in front of you. And so that has been critical that to maintain the not knowing and not knowing is that coming back to it's my opinion. Um, those opinions that we have, and we all have them, those con that con this conditioning that we've been brought up with, the conditioning that we uh, embrace to feel comfortable within the tribes in which we run, whether political or social or religious or anything else, those opinions can be helpful sometimes, but they also are our own jails. And if we can't uh, find a way to see through them, then we're, we'll, we'll be stuck in, in those opinions in that knowing. Again, it's not saying you don't have experience. You don't know how to use a hammer. You don't know how to use a balance sheet. You don't know how to cook a, a, a great pie. But that's not always going to be the right solution. And bearing witness means to really see what's going on without that expectation of what you think should be happening. And when you can really step into that, and I find for me, when I can carry those three tenets with me each moment, whether it's in politics or anywhere, it's a tremendous sense of freedom and, and, and my heart feels so much better that I'm serving those around me in a much better, more effective way. I fail every day, all day long. I mean, it's, it's, it's noticeable when I'm actually stepping into and carrying those three tenets with me in each moment. But I always appreciate them. And I, I think that they've been critical uh, for my success uh, to the degree I've had any, um, but also my own well-being and, and, and giving me the ability to carry on in the face of some very, you know, very challenging situations. And of course, meditation practice, prayer, um, you know, whatever it is that, that, that you find can help you stay grounded in, in your own body and in, 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 in your own heart uh, is necessary too to maintain uh, some sense of sanity and, and compassion for yourself. I know many of us, and certainly in my case, uh, before I uh, meditate, I go through a series of prayers or vows, and one of, the, one of those includes the word virtue. And I think we all have a sense of virtuous behavior, uh, virtuous speech, virtuous action, um, virtuous thoughts. Um, and sadly, and I'll show you something in a minute that I think might help uh, explain this challenge for us is those virtues that we all take, each of us have a sense of what's virtuous. And we think because it's, in our opinion, a virtuous view, action, whatever, we just assume that everybody knows that's virtue. Those are virtuous actions. It's not the case. Um, Jeff, can you put that first slide up for me, please? And I apologize for using, I have two PowerPoints, there's only one, but I, it's, it's so much easier to show this than it is to describe. I, some of you may know of this book, The Righteous Mind. Um, I found it extraordinarily helpful to understanding how we can have such strong opinions uh, and so have such a difficult time talking about it. And he, he mentions in this book, uh, and it's, it's again, I, I recommend it highly, but he mentions six moral foundation building blocks, if you will. You'll notice this chart, those of you that can count. <laughs> there's only five. The reason there's only five is because one of those six is fortunately shared by all. That's the one that's about liberty and um, uh, avoiding op oppression. Now, everybody supports and, and embraces that as uh, a, a, a moral foundation, that everyone should have liberty and, and no one should be oppressed. But look at the other five, care, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And what's interesting, and then probably not surprising, is that the different, and you look at either end of the scale, they're cons very conservative and very, very um, liberal. Um, 
it's not just that there's a difference, but there's an aversion on liberals. Not, there's not just neutral, there's actual aversion for the loyalty, authority, and sanctity. Uh, careness and fair, uh, care and fairness, uh, pretty, pretty equal for the conservatives with a little less, uh, not as important, but certainly it's not, they're not in opposition. At, at worst, it's neutral. So wherever you fall on that scale, and again, this isn't about saying any one view is right or wrong. And I could spend, and I'm not going to here, but I could spend a lot of time in terms of talking about what loyalty means and what care means and what authority might mean. And you may find authority is repulsive, uh, but that's not how everybody feels. And you may find that authority is obviously important, but that's not how everybody feels. So understanding where you are on this might help you place yourself in a, in a way to understand where others might be and respect that that's their moral foundation. And as important as your own views of what's virtuous are, that's held by folks that have a different view of that. Not right or wrong. I mean, you can have the opinion that one's right or wrong, but you're stepping into your own jail by doing that in terms of inhibiting your ability to really own, recognize, and walk as part of one body. Um, just before we leave this slide, um, fairness is, a, is an interesting term. And I'll just point out that while fairness seems relatively level across the, the scale, it doesn't mean the same thing to different people. Fairness to folks who are conservative means I put in a lot of effort I, earn, I, I, I get a lot back for my effort. That's my effort. And it's only fair that I get my, to keep my effort. Fairness for liberals is if people aren't being treated well, if, if they don't have the same opportunity, if they, if they are not uh, in, in, in equal status, then that's not fair. It's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I, don't, I don't know how each of you feel, but you can sort of own and, and recognize both of those perhaps or not. Again, it's just a different way of looking at things and people who have different views from you own these virtues as much as you own yours. Um, so the next slide I wanna show you is one that is, I have found is equally important to understanding how we orient ourselves and how we, uh, we have the, the building blocks that I just pointed out. And this next slide that Jeff's gonna put up shortly is about worldviews. And this comes out of uh, a Yale study group and has been, I think has been supported by others. And it talks about, you having trouble or should I just talk about it? Ah, oh, there it is, okay. So it, it, again, the way you were brought up, the family in which you were born and also the very sort of genetic chemicals of background in your in your being when you were born create conditioning to prefer on this grid uh, a hierarchic or uh, authoritarian kind of structure you feel more comfortable and you recognize and, and respect that uh, more or less than one that's egalitarian likewise what does the community Oh, folks, is it, is it less people should be individualistic and they should they, the individuals responsible for taking care of themselves or is the community responsible for taking care of everybody and doing what's best for the larger whole? Again, no one, this, this isn't a black and white issue, but it's a scale in which people find themselves. And if you're speaking to someone who is just naturally more comfortable with an with a authoritarian perspective on things, and that's the opposite of where you are. Don't try, to, it's not about trying to convince them to change their view. It's about recognizing that's their view. That's another part of the one body in which we operate. And so I, I just, I wanna put that out there so that you can see that opinion too. So we can go back to seeing everybody now, Jeff, thank you. So a little bit of background, uh, uh, just in terms of how we might uh, loosen our own views of ourselves and, and, uh, and loosen our views of judging others. 
perspectives. And I, there's a quote here by a, a writer I love by the name of David French, who writes for the National Review. And I think it's sadly true. Um, Americans are polarized in the worst possible way. Two tribes, not so much united by love of their own as hatred for the other. Um, how do you feel? I mean, and you know, in the political worlds in which you run, does that resonate with you? I mean, it's, and who owns that? I'd say we each, we each own that. Um, and now I'm going to ask you to pick up your opinions again, to step into the ideas that you carry and hold and feel quite certain are truths. And, I, I, and obviously, when we're talking about our own preferences and biases at this moment in time, thankfully, the big one is race. And we need to, um, we need to keep this in front and we need to each recognize our own biases here and our own ownership in this problem. It's, it's, we all have it and we all have a responsibility to work towards uh, reducing that issue. But staying with that, what is your opinion of the police? Need your reaction? They're all bad. We need to get rid of them. Or do we need the police? How do you feel about violence and protests? Immigration. How do you feel about an immigrant from pick any country? one you don't like or one you like, versus Hillary Clinton's de description of the deplorables. Do you have an aversion or an attraction to an immigrant more than a deplorable? They're the same. We're all the same, but we label them and we separate them that way. And we, we put them in a very nice little box and we're pretty comfortable. We've settled that problem, haven't we? Well, we haven't when we keep, keep that separation. Immigration in general, should the borders be 100% closed or 100% open? Well, I think most of us would agree that neither one of those is an answer. So why can't we talk about what the middle is? Why can't we just sit down and listen to what the other side feels and to try to find something that works? Bankers versus bricklayers. AOC versus Trump. The same, the same. So take your pick of your aversions and your attractions and own them, recognize them. Because this is our collective karma, right? We can't stop the cycle of cause and effect and point blame at anyone else. We all have contributed. <clears throat> so I think, therefore, this is the best time to practice those three tenets, grounding our perceptions and actions in the wholeness of life, rather than in fear and bias. If we serve the whole, we can find strength and patience, humor and determination. If we think of others as opposed to ourselves, then we can step outside of our own jails. And Bernie wrote a great book, and I, I know a number of you are familiar with it, but it's called Instructions to the Cook. And it's actually based on a, a foundational teaching of Dogen. Uh, and it's, I, I like it a lot. And, and basically what he's telling you, if you don't know the book, is you're in your own kitchen. You've got your own ingredients. And you may or may not have salt or soy or peppers or protein. But whatever you have... And whatever your skills are, whether you're a baker or a fryer or a griller, take your ingredients and make the best meal possible to serve. So what are your ingredients? What are your skills? What are your resources? What are your contacts? Be an engaged citizen. Find your focus. Be, in, be engaged with life through the political process as well as everything else that shows up. Encourage others to get involved in a constructive way. Look 
couple of practical solutions or suggestions, turn off the TV. Stop watching that stuff because it's built to close your mind and your heart. But definitely step outside of your own echo chamber political bubble and look for thoughtful opinions that are not consistent with your own. Try them on. You might find your own views are softening a little bit. You might find, okay, a better understanding of why other people have different opinions, not changing your own mind, but just a better understanding of what else is going on in this one body in which we participate, which we are, which we, you know, which is us. And don't, you know, the, the, the worldview graph I showed you that, that, that uh, you know, that graph was, it's important because we feel comfortable with leadership and thought leaders, whether political leaders or commentators on TV and folks we read, who we believe share our worldview. And why is that important? Because most of us, all of us really, no one has time to investigate each of the issues that face us politically and come up with a, a view that, that is, is fully informed. We don't have time. So we default to letting our political leadership, our, you know, those thought leaders who share our worldview because of things they've said and, or things that our own uh, uh, local bubble of uh, supportive uh, uh, political share view people think is a leader, and we let them set our opinions. Question that. I'm not saying that those opinions are wrong, but make, don't hold them so dearly particularly if you haven't really had the chance to develop that opinion yourself with good research and good, good uh, uh, investigation. And one of the best ways to do that is to read other opinions of that issue. And I wanna to come to, I'm, I'm coming to the end and we'll get to, to questions. And I'm looking forward to learning from everyone here too and, and sharing our thoughts. But one of the classic things that I come across and it's, you know, very common within the Buddhist world is do we fix the system or is it really just beyond being fixed? Do we break it? You know, anarchy and revolution. Um, I, I would just point out for those of you that are tempted to think that way, to think through how much suffering is caused with revolution and anarchy and what is the better system I would posit that capitalism is a tool, like a knife, like fire, that properly used for benefit is a great benefit in the hands of the wrong party, a thief instead of a chef, an arsonist instead of a cook. Knives and fire can cause a lot of damage, but capitalism itself is merely a tool and if it's properly guided can actually be a solution to things like climate and others but we have to have political leadership to make put in those guardrails and to manage that system and who does political leadership answer to us they work for us and we forget that and we get lost in the system that we are not i mean i think one of the things that's sad is so many of us, and I made a little brief reference to it earlier, think of ourselves more as, well, we don't want to label ourselves as consumers, but we act like we're nothing but consumers instead of being citizens. It's our democracy. And we are the ones that need to keep it alive. So I would ask you, in, just to close, to recognize your importance and your opportunity to engage with local leadership, political leadership, national, state level, whatever, in a respectful way. One of the things that disappoints me is I hear people, I, I try to encourage people to let, let your representatives know how you feel about whatever the issues are. And I've had people proudly show me that two page letter where they just ripped into them like, yeah, I don't know why anyone ever voted for you. And I was like, no. That's not the way to build a relationship. You need to build a relationship with these folks who are representing us so that you can have a good constructive dialogue, finding common ground to help make the changes we need to change to keep our democracy alive.
to reduce the suffering in the U.S. and the rest of the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Grant. And I, uh, uh, I just took the spotlight off, uh, which I don't know if that shows up on everyone's screens or not. So uh, um, let's take comments or questions from everyone. Um, uh, and, and as you're viewing, if, if you, everyone, everyone I'm sure knows this by now, but if you'd like to have a full screen of whoever's speaking, just go ahead and hit your speaker view and you'll have a full screen of the speaker. Uh, but I won't, I won't be doing that behind here. Um, I can see everybody. So, uh, you know, if we'd like to kind of rely on old school and you wave your hand that you want to speak, that's okay. Or if you want to raise your electronic hand down before down below and before we take questions um and, and grant uh, th this is bringing in my my filters here too it's a question for you actually uh on how you want to have a discussion we could and 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 I, I i say this from a personal standpoint because this is where i'm going in my head we could end up having a very political discussion right now and I, if you if you if you want to go down that road, then but I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to say, yeah, that's fine. Or I, you know, what your, what your talk really was about was, you know, was heart and how we approach our lives and how we feel, and and it could go one direction or another. Or if you wanted to see what happens, I think the three tenets are a good way to approach this next section. Okay, <laughs> so be it. <laughs> so be it. Um, so if anybody would like to, and again, uh, just a reminder, the recording is on. Um, uh, so if anyone would like to ask a question or make a statement or, or clarify or, or whatever, uh, please go ahead and do this or raise the little electronic hand. And if a few seconds goes by and no one does, I have a, uh, there, uh, Bruce, please go ahead and you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Grant. That was very fun and interesting to hear. Uh, I just wanted to pick one comment where you said that fairness is a word that means something different to two different groups in their spectrum. When I took an online test that was designed to tell me where I lay on the spectrum that you showed with that one chart, the, the two dimensional chart, it told me that I was authoritarian. Actually, even Heights test showed that I was okay with authoritarian or with an authority figure. And as a scientist who's always questioned authority, I found that disconcerting. And I had to perform kind of a mental flip to say, what I'm really comfortable with is recognizing that someone other than myself may know something that I don't know. And I'm willing to, once I find them credible as an authority, I'm willing to let them play the authority in that space. And that made it more comfortable for me to be thought, thinking of myself as an authoritarian. And I'm just curious if you think, is that fair for me to do, or do I really have a, am I fooling myself by taking this? <laughs> Thanks, Bruce, and good to see you. Um, uh, anything's fair. Uh, so I, I, it's you know, far be it for me to say that's not fair. What I would say is, what I'm hearing you say, or what I would, my response would say, I, I'm hearing you say you felt a little shame on being ranked authoritarian. I would suggest that maybe you just be aware of it without shame. It's just where you are. And uh, that's okay. Uh, the, the, my own opinion is that it's necessary to have a balance for that. I mean, when you're in school, the principal's in charge, the teacher's in charge of the classroom. And you know, we all have experience when we were in school with the folks that fought that. And it, it wasn't good for those of us who were watching it because it was disruptive. It wasn't good for those people. It was certainly wasn't good for the teacher. So there's clearly a role for authoritarian structures. It's, it's how much we defer to that and how much we allow ourselves. And I would say, I'm going to take the opportunity, thanks for that lead, to step back and go, those of you who don't think you uh, abide in the authoritarian side, ask yourselves, is there not some kind of authoritarian influence when you are allowing the thought leaders in your political bubble drive your opinion so firmly? Uh, 
Thanks, Bruce. Um, my friend Peter from Kansas City has his electronic hand up. Thanks for doing that, Peter. Good morning. Thanks, Grant. Uh, four years ago, I had, I wouldn't consider it a privilege, but I ran for a seat in the Arizona State Legislature when I was living in Northern Arizona in a district that the outcome was inevitable. Um, it was, a, and still is just staunch conservative. But uh, I, I remember election night four years ago, I knew what was going to happen in my race, but just surrounded by the county, uh, Yavapai County Democratic leadership were absolute shock and disbelief. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to go as far as saying I kind of saw it coming, but I, I think this is where not knowing really came in. And over the next few days, uh, I was impressed. Bernie Glassman was one of several uh, Zen uh, teachers that I had seen to actually respond to a breaking uh, somewhat from tradition and acknowledging that yes, a political event really was very impactful in our communities. And uh, someone I quoted frequently, and I'm going to bring it up on my screen and just read us one brief passage was Jeffrey Shugan Arnold at Zen Mountain Monastery, uh, Mountain and Rivers Orders, when yep. he talked about uh, our response to this, to live within delusion knowingly, to meet closed eyes with open eyes, to be a peaceful warrior, and to be a peaceful warrior means sometimes you have to raise some hell, but you raise hell peacefully. And uh, so many of my cohorts, and I gave that talk uh, in several arenas back in my former home in Prescott, Arizona, and the inevitable question was, well, what does that mean? And my answer was, I don't know. Uh, but it, with, with that, the, the three tenets really come into play here. Uh, entering these situations and in increasingly the last six, uh, eight months, we've uh, seen such unrest in our country. Um, we'll know it when we see it. Uh, in going into where we step in, where we actively engage and where we raise hell peaceful, we will certainly with, with not knowing and bearing witness, we have an opportunity to see it when it arises. But I think just as importantly, we'll, we'll know what it's not when it arises as well. Yes, uh, I, I love that term, peaceful warrior. Um, and I, I, you know, it can mean for each of us what it means. Uh, I, I think it, and I'm finding myself remembering uh, uh, different comments on the emotion of anger. But, you know, anger in, in the eyes of many is definitely not virtuous. Anger is definitely something to be avoided and pushed away, but in fact, uh, the Dalai Lama and, and many other teachers, and it's my own opinion as well, that anger is an emotion we're going to feel. You can't deny that emotion. It's whether or not you recognize that emotion and use it as the energy to empower you to be a peaceful warrior, if that's what needs to happen, and to, to not let it take over and to get in the way of really truly bearing witness with a not knowing mind and acting in a way that's going to reduce suffering the best, most effective way. So thank you. I think peaceful war is a very powerful way to look at it. And I think each of us as if we're going to be engaged citizens, it's perfectly fine to consider yourself a peaceful warrior in terms of protecting our democracy, protecting those who don't have the ability to and the privilege, et cetera, that, that each of us might have so that it is actually a more fair country for everybody, however fairness is described. Thank you. That was great, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Um, Mark, you've got your hand up, it looks like. Please go ahead and unmute. Hi, good to see you. Okay, so yeah, uh, going with that, that peaceful warrior concept, um, I, I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with uh, um, the way of, of Martin Luther King in dealing with injustice and um, aggression. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like there's more aggression in this country right now than in the past. And when we talk about the three tenants, um, boy, I'm working so hard to really uh, grok them and internalize them. But I feel like uh, it's much harder to do now than it was 
just a, a short while ago, because, because of this aggression. Um, and so maybe part of it is just, th the thing that I loved about Dr. King was that he always separated the people from the issues. He was always for things rather than against them. And, and I did a little bit of research just on my own and I, I couldn't find any time where he ever uh, said a certain politician was a jerk or, or where uh, he tried to instigate a personal fight. He always gave people the opportunity to change their mind and be allies or to be friends on some level. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Martin Luther King and Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi's nonviolent action took down the British Empire in India. And it was, it was the only path. I mean, it's, it was brutal. And those peaceful warriors that stood in front of the, I'm going to start crying, stood in front of that barrack, you know, trying to block the barracks and getting attacked. And they just stood there and took the beating. That is strong. That's courage. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to say, forgive me, Mark, but I think we're probably close to the same age. And I would suggest that this time, our memories should also reflect back. The 60s were horrible. We used to have bombings going on throughout the country. The, the demonstrations against the war were, were very violent. The weathermen, I mean, there's, honestly, as bad as it is now, and I acknowledge it's horrible. The difference is it, the, the, the people, our fellow citizens are wrapped up in it more aggressively than it was back in those days. And those, in those days, my, my opinion, my, my remembrance is that it was the, the radical fringe that was causing a lot of the problems. Of course, as, as I'm listening to my opinion, I'm thinking that, no, it was, it, there were the, the, the hard hats going against the hippies. And I mean, it was, it was bad. And I, I don't, I'm not going to say it was worse, but right now it's very bad. We need to do something about it. We can't, we can't handle that one, but we can do something about this one. And, I, and so for me, I find the three tenets is the, the more challenging it becomes, the more important it is to stay with. Period. For me, because that, that nonviolence approach can, is, is, uh, is you're able to maintain it, or I find myself able to maintain it. If I can stay with the three tenets, I can get violent. I have, I can get, have violent thoughts and think about doing violent things. This has happened to me. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately I haven't, but what I can step back into recognizing we are all the same body. There are no deplorables. There aren't, I mean, you know, how can you, how can you consider someone a deplorable if they've lost their job and, and they're in the rust belt, they've lost their job. Two of their three kids are, are uh, addicts and, and, you know, it's, and they're, they're just they're closed in and nobody cares about them. They're angry, you know. I, I, now that anger to me is not is in, can you can't compare to the the anger that uh, the, the the black folks have had to deal with, the non-white folks in general have dealt with in this country in terms of the inequality. But that's all who we are, and the three tenets are the gift. I think. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Uh, everyone uh, might want to know, uh, John Parker posted a comment uh, in the chat to everyone. John, feel free to, to, to state that, or if you'd rather have people read it, that's fine. That's, the, uh, that's your choice. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, was just, uh, I was just typing some thoughts. I, I don't need to expand more on, on that. I just, uh, uh, Part of my part of my work is at a public policy institute, and uh, one of our one of our supervisors um, gets really passionate about the Constitution in a good way. Um, and uh, you know, it was Constitution Day this week, and there was some learning I think a lot of us had around uh, sort of the inadequacies of the Constitution in terms of uh, political representation. Um, and uh, regardless of where you fall along the along the political spectrum, 
and there's just a lot of dysfunction that's set up in the structure, both in the, in the legislature, executive branch, and the judicial branch. And um, there's, there's, uh, there's no, you know, I think we know money has an outside influence on politics. And uh, part of that has to do with how our representation isn't um, that well suited. And, and disengagement in politics um, uh, only fuels uh, the, the power that money has in politics as things currently are situated. So I just, uh, you know, more engagement is better. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of us on this call would prefer money had less influence in politics, but I just, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot about how our current structure and government is, is structured through the constitution that's inadequate for where we are right now as a country. So, um, and that was, uh, sometimes I, I don't spend as much time thinking about those structures cause I'm more of an egalitarian sort. Um, and, uh, it's just interesting to see where politics preys on the, the, the weak links, if you will. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, I, I, the, my first response is uh, I, I would disagree with one thing, and that is it's not outside influence that money has, it's inside influence, sadly. Um, and I would imagine everybody on this call, and I think I've seen polls, I, I, I think it's, it's consistent. It's, I don't know whether the number's in the 60s or the 70s, but Americans feel the same way. The problem is that the money keeps it the way it is because the money gets the influence the way it is, so... Oh yeah, right. you know, we're we're saying the same thing, just different. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and I I think you're absolutely right to to reinforce the need for us to be engaged. Um, I come out of the financial world, and in the financial world, one of the things that took down or created the financial crisis back in 2008 was something called the financial derivatives. And I like to use that term because a derivative is not the actual item. So that's what the derivative is, right? So for me, money is a derivative of the real power. The real power is our vote. What happens is the money feeds the ads, feeds the thought, thought leaders and, and uh, the different uh, bubbleized, if I might call them that, news channels and new, news, news channels in the general full media sense to influence our opinions. And so we mindlessly go off and vote without full critical thinking in ways that support the money that's bought the influence. We can only break that if we decide to be active, engaged citizens. And I did have some fun identifying and, 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 I, and Jeff sort of noted at the beginning that citizen ends with Zen. Yeah. <laughs> so, but be engaged, and, and Zen is being engaged with life. And politics is not separate from life. So this is what today is about. And, and uh, so thank you, John. Grant, if I could, uh, I've got a number of questions, but I don't want to dominate. So I'll try to focus on one that's, that's really bubbling for me right now. <clears throat> um, I completely agree with you. A label like deplorables it does not help anybody. And that was unfortunate uh, four years ago. That was a blunder. That was a gift to the opposition. So, uh, but at the same time, I, I recognize that tendency. I'm Irish. I can insult people as well as anybody. I'm really good at it. I'm a professional. Um, and I'm training myself out of that because it doesn't add anything at all. Nonetheless, a question I think for you is how do we approach, engage with, interact with, listen to certain people? And I won't use any names, but uh, an administration ad advisor who is an unrepentant racist, a leader who labels the 1619 Project as toxic propaganda by, you know, and then off into a whole 
bunch of pejorative terms. Um, officials who enact policy to put children in cages or to, or to perform medical procedures on women unwittingly. The label, and I, and, and, I, I, and, and I can reach in my pocket and bring out a whole bunch of great labels for that that'll make me feel real good to feel righteously angry about those people. I know better than that. I know that that doesn't help me, it doesn't help them, and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for anyone else, <clears throat> either, either to engage people into action or, or to, you know, uh, promote oneness and and I and there is oneness there nonetheless they're doing things that need to be stopped and uh I go ahead and use all you go ahead and use the name I'm not sure to what end uh now perhaps I might learn something I don't know but to sit down and listen to Stephen Miller spew his racist anti-semitic toxic stew <clears throat> um, would take a great deal of patience to begin with, but I'm not sure. I, I'm, you know, you see kind of what I'm wrestling with is, you know, in, you know and God forbid, uh, I'll use the word, uh, you know, when we truly encounter evil. And uh, I don't want to break the Godwin rule and go back to what would I have done in 1939? I just did, I guess. Uh, but but here we are. We're face to face with demonstrable evil, and and you know uh, there's a equivalency is, doesn't help. <laughs> Being clear about resistance and opposition, I think, is what's called for in some cases, and that's a slippery slope. So I'll I'll be quiet there and and just see if that stirred up anything for you, Grant. And thank you. Yeah, Thank sure. you for being kind to me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm going to go back and reverse order it. So I'm not, you, you said that the things that need to be addressed in some instances, I'd say in many, there's a lot of them. Uh, and, 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 I, and then go back to the beginning. I'm not suggesting that when I, by being an engaged citizen, that one needs to sit down and listen to uh, diatribes of, of, of hatred. That's why I say turn off the TV. That's not the engagement that I'm suggesting. And, I'm, and, and it, it would be impossible, honestly, for you or any of us to sit down with the president or members of his cabinet uh, or uh, the, the speakers, you know, what's his name, Tucker or Carlson or whatever his name is on Fox, <clears throat> and have a conversation with them because you're going to be the target of their usual bullhorn. That's not listening. You already know. See, there's the knowing thing, right? You already know what they're saying. You've heard it. That's not, that's, that's, that's not what, what I would be recommending. So <clears throat> coming back to, to Bernie's instructions to the cook and recognizing our ingredients, what, you know, what are our skills? Who do we know? What are our resources? Uh, what does our heart call us to focus on? I mean, it may be race, it may be immigration, it may be, I'm, I know this is going to sound crazy, taxes, or it could be uh, medical, or it could be in, uh, wh whatever it is. Get involved, find those others who are in that space, working in that space, then they may have different opinions from yours, and, and find out what it is, and, and, and use, there's a great uh, poly, a Buddhist term called upaya. For those of you that know it, then you know it, but those of you that don't know it, it just means skillful means. And that skillful means is part of the bearing witness, part of the bringing and not knowing to the situation. Because if you bear witness you, without preconceived ideas of what ought to be going on, then you can have a chance of finding a chink in the wall, the, the door handle that might let you get through. Again, not with the intention to change someone else's mind, because if you go into any engagement with that goal, you've already set yourself back in terms of being successful in connecting in the one body sense, and then finding the common ground and getting 
an understanding with this other party how we might work together to reduce suffering because <clears throat> despite whatever the world views are and whatever your moral foundations are that I, that I spoke about briefly we all are humans and we all want to reduce suffering that's that's a given the dalai lama has said that many times i abide it the challenge is that that many of us are stuck in reducing suffering only with our own body or our own family or our own immediate circle and the challenge is to invite people to step outside of those one body views into the larger whole one body of everyone and you got to find a, a, a skillful way to engage them in a way that lets their heart open up to perhaps that possibility that maybe everybody else is a human being just like me and we all need <clears throat> to work on reducing our, our joint suffering does that help yeah that helps yeah um i see i see chats going by if anybody uh would like to share anything that you're you're chatting on that's that's fine or if there's an other another comment or question yeah i'm focusing on the screen i'm not looking at the chat i mean if i need to let me know jeff yeah no it's it's okay and I, and, and, I'll, and i'll i'll leave it anybody who has chatted who wants to share it they can <clears throat> do so verbally too so feel free to jump in don't leave it to me because i have a long I have a long list of comments. <laughs> I don't want to dominate this. So, Deanna, hi. Hi. Um, I appreciate everything that people are sharing here, and and Grant, so grateful for your talk. Um, I feel like I need to hear many more hours of that kind of thing. Something I'm really struggling with right now, and I'm probably going to cry, is that. A lot of people I'm very close to have gone down the fucking rabbit, excuse my language, the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. And these are friends who are liberal, progressive. They have the same kind of politics that I do. They're, they would identify as, and I consider them spiritual, um, people with longtime spiritual practices, including one of my best friends. And I don't know how to approach this. I realized a few months ago that I can't even engage in conversation about the actual content of what they believe because there's a loop that's been created where anything that I say is used as proof that I'm one of the sheeple. So I don't go there at all. But what, what has been arising for me lately is a huge amount of grief. Um, and I'm allowing that to arise personally, but I don't know how to engage with people that I care about who are, who are in this mindset now. And it seems to be getting more prevalent and worse. I'm in Taos, New Mexico, and there's a lot of this. And there's a lot of division now too, because there are people like me who think that it's nonsense and, and actually very dangerous. And then there are all these other people, yoga instructors I know, you know, meditators, I mean, and they're, they're way down that that hole. I just don't know how to deal with it. If you have any thoughts about that, yeah, I, I, I yes, uh, in our family we have folks that have views that are, um, yeah. It's just like how do you get there? Um, and there's two thoughts I have. I mean, it's it's. Um, I'm not sure how helpful they'll be, but try to hold them as I'm sure you are anyway in your heart with love. I mean, I think you start with that. And then I'm reminded of, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very poor teacher in the sense of not being able to identify uh, lineage quotes and things. It always sounds when I'm listening to someone else who can say, oh, well, the fifth patriarch said this or whatever. I'm always so impressed. Well, I can't do that. And I'm old enough now to know that it's not worth my, well, I don't know, whatever. But one of the things that I've heard that I really love in a situation like that, and I, I'm reminded of when dealing with someone who's so closed in their loops, whatever the whatever it is, I mean, it could be the conspiracy theories, it can be racism, whatever. If they're stuck, then just use Socratic method, right? Just ask questions. 
And the question, I mean, you can ask specific questions to the situation in which you find yourself, but the one that I'd love to default to is, is that so? Oh, is that so? There's no, it's just, oh, is that so? You know, it's just, it helps you calm down because you're recognizing that's just another opinion. Oh, is that so? I hope that, I don't know whether that helps, but. Curious. Thanks, Gianna. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I love that. I love the opportunity to bring that up. Is, is that so? <laughs> Amy Jonan, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Grant. I have been working a lot with not knowing and in engagement politically, and in two ways. Uh, one is that personal not knowing. Um, do I know myself? How are my views changing? How does a certain you know new um, circumstance resonate through me, you know, um, I've been taking a lot of time to reflect on, on not knowing myself. And I think that that kind of helps me feel a little bit grounded as well. And I'm very much reminded in that sense of, of Dr. King and Gandhi, because they really did believe that you had better do a lot of self investigation because the work that you engage in, is difficult, it's going to be emotionally trying, it's going to be physically trying, you're going to be put through the ringer and you have to be rooted and grounded and not just in one permanent spot, that has to be evolving. That has to be changing and adapting as our situation changes and adapts as well. And so the ongoing personal investigation I think is, is extremely important and um, I really appreciate your answer just now uh, to Diana. My, um, we have a family member, my husband and I have a family member who is right, someone who's of a very different political perspective than we are. And because it's someone who's so close to us, it's been very straining on, on the relationship. And um, not too long ago on the last time we visited, pre-pandemic, uh, um, we really were very purposeful about approaching our family member with a mind of not knowing because we figured we just don't know the underlying story for how they got to this particular point. And uh, so we didn't ever meet their, um, their statements with our own statements. We met their statements with our questions and really took that opportunity to dig a little bit deeper, to get to know rather than just the talking points that they were sticking to from their news sources and their political people, we wanted to get to know what they were feeling vulnerable about. Why were those things important to them? Because obviously there was something that they were grasping onto because of a fear, a worry, a concern, a vulnerability that they were having. And, um, that was one of the most insightful visits that we had, uh, again, you know, pre, pre pandemic, not to say that that was the be all end all. This is again, absolutely an ongoing practice. And every time even a phone call conversation happens, we remind ourselves to meet that with what's their story beneath their talking points. Um, and it goes back to your introduction of, we all have a story to tell and providing a platform for people to share their own individual heart story rather than having them stick to the talking points. To me, that's been where shift can actually happen. Well said, well said. I, I think um, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have anything to add. I mean, that's just, it's, it's it, 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 other than to repeat what I said at the beginning, which you have taken advantage of the fact that this political situation is so polarizing. It's in your face and you woke up to that. And now you use that 
constructively to remind you to use the three tenets. And look at the gift it is, right? So uh, that's, that's, that's the thing that can be so beautiful about this very ugly, divisive period we're in is it's in our face and it can be the reminder to use the three tenets for all of those occasions, but ideally every moment in, in, our, in our daily life. Yeah, thank you, Amy. <clears throat> Thanks, Amy. Anyone else? Did I see a hand? Oh, hi, hi Linda. Hi. You know, I was, a lot of what I think about is, you know, I'm thinking about it in terms of what I've known about neurology. Um, when people get into their, what they call the lizard brain, where it's the fight and flight. Um, and it seems like a lot of people are there today. That's where we're there. <laughs> and, um, you know, including myself sometimes, I have to get me out, myself out of that, you know. So then, because what happens is that what I've been, um, come to understand is that your upper brain or whatever turns off. And so you can't think and reason or whatever. So, you know, I think what Amy was just saying is trying to get people maybe a little calmed down and out of that defensiveness and lizard brain so you can actually, you know, have some kind of meaningful, like you, you feel heard, they feel heard, get out of this, you know, you're stupid, you're wrong, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, um, and try to get to that place. But it seems, and of course, I think a lot of, unfortunately, you know, I have to say some of, you know, like our, you know, president um, tries to fan that lizard brain. Um, and so the more we get into that, the, the more we can't think and we can't discuss and we can't, um, you know, really reach any kind of, get anywhere else except we're fight and flight. <laughs> you know, so it's just my thought that I had. Thanks, Linda. You know, it's uh, I, I, the, the fight flight thing, of course, is uh, typically said is the, the fight, flight, or fear, freeze, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I have a dear friend, David Loy, that many of you will know, know, who introduced me to the fourth F. So, there's freeze, fight, flight, flock. <laughs> Yeah. Flock is what I th is 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 what I think we're doing more than anything else. And in flocking, we're reinforcing the fear that causes us to flock and separate further from those who aren't in our flock, and to see the other flock as the the cause of our fear. So that's uh, that's uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to mention that because I I've, I've found that. Uh, very helpful when when he, when he first shared that with me. The other thing I'd, I'd want to reinforce is, I think you 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 make a good point reinforcing what Amy said about you know getting into uh, a calm space and getting out of our lizard brain and 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 telling the lizard brain, thank you very much. Uh, you've helped me survive this long, but uh, I'm not going to let you be in control right now. So that you step into that 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 way yourself because if you're not there, there's no way you can help anyone else get there. So you got to get there yourself before you can uh, uh, give that gift to anybody else. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Grant. <clears throat> uh, and let me just interject here too. A couple of people have had to step off uh, and, and just I want to uh, get in this comment before anyone else might have to leave. If you're interested in the chat log, because uh, I know there are some links and references that people have shared. If you're interested in the chat log, I am saving it. And so you can send an email to, you can see how my name is spelled, G-E-O-F-F, -F, Jeff at zenpeacemakers.org. And uh, I'd be happy to send you the chat log once it's ready, so. You know, speaking of this, so I just want to interject real quickly uh, that uh, Bruce Moreland, who I've, I've known for many years, uh, is on here too. And Bruce points out, I think somewhere in there about braver angels. Um, and, and for those of you that don't know about braver angels, I would, I think you put the link in Bruce. Is that right? Yeah. So check it out. It's really a cool, you know, it, it refers back to Lincoln's 
address when he talks about our our, our better angels um, in his in his first inaugural speech when he was hoping to avoid the civil war, which was a hopeless hope. Um, but it's about trying to bridge this divide. So you, it, that might be a way for you to be engaged. Back to you, Jeff. Uh, I was just going to say, if you scroll down to the bottom of the chat and click on the three dots, you can save the chat. Yeah, I did that. Th thanks, Jerry. <clears throat> Anyone else? Jerry, <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> Comment or a question? Tom looks like Tom's got to go. So yeah, we don't we don't need to keep everybody on. I mean, you know, we I just want to make sure that we I made that I was available if we needed the full ninety minutes. But uh, I've really really appreciated the the uh, the input from everybody, and I want to just in in closing, unless someone else has something, uh, just to repeat the the invitation, the request the plea to be engaged with your heart and be engaged with your non-lizard mind, but lead with your heart and um, help reduce suffering, you know, help protect our democracy. It's, it's still uh, an experiment. And as it's, uh, it's being a little bit rattled right now and we need to keep it alive. So, Unless there's anything else, Jeff, I think we can bow and say goodbye and thank you. I, I, just, I just wanted to say, if we could, um, yeah, I, I agree about the engagement. I think, um, you know, that what I've been working out a lot on is trying to get information out about voting to people because, you know, if people are going to be using the absentee voting. Um, there's, you know, it's very specific how do you have to fill out the forms and, and, um, and so I think it's important to try to get, share that with, with first of all, encourage people we know, I, I feel, to vote. I think it's absolutely critical that we participate. Um, but also to give them information um, that they might not have as to, in their state or whatever. Vote.org is a great um, site because it does give very um, specific information for each state. Um, and so just to kind of, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, trying to block the vote, you know, <laughs> trying to uh, suppress it, I guess is the word. And so, um, you know, if we could really engage with our, the people we know and possibly, um, you, know, with, um, you know, I'm working with elders, Stanford Fair Elections, New Hampshire. They have groups all over um, Arizona and different places. So um, we're just trying to reach out and, and provide that information. Yeah, to people, that's different ways of it, you know? Great reminder, and I think that's a perfect way to close because I mentioned the beginning voting. I mm -hmm. think Jeff might have something to say too, which is fine. I'm, so we're not closing, but voting is the most important thing we can do right now and encouraging other people to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. ab absolutely critical. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and speaking of voting, uh, make sure that you check out your local uh, polling stations, uh, the people that are coordinating that because they need volunteers. Um, and you know that's a that's a brave thing to be doing, uh, uh, but we need it. Uh, that's another way you can be an engaged citizen. Yeah. Thank Jeff, you. you. Had your hand up. Somebody had their hand up. No, nope. I thought Jeff did. Jeff oh. did. Yeah. This Jeff? Oh, the other Jeff. There's two Jeffs. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> thank you, Grant, and thank you, everybody, for everything you've said. And you already answered my question and what you just said, Grant. However, I'll still ask the question. And yes, to be with the heart and really be with the heart as we're doing whatever we're doing, heart, mind. And my question is, what are the three most important things that you're doing, if it's not too much to ask you, as just the human being that you are, in addition to what you said about the importance to tell others and encourage others to vote and to vote ourselves and to do some telephone calling. So what, what am I doing to be engaged? Uh, well, yes, and, and before yeah. you answer that question, the way I look at it is this, if you're a professional football coach, these coaches look at the team that they're playing and they look at every weakness of every player and they play 
toward the weakness of a person who has got a weak ankle or a weak shoulder. And the other thing I just want to mention is there are people who have computers who are actually listening to these conversations and they actually know where this conversation goes. They actually, through their computer analysis, and this is not forbidden TV, I don't watch it, they know what will come of this. And I sort of feel like the opposing football coach is looking at my team years and years and years ago. I used to coach football for just a while on request. It wasn't my <laughs> request. And I feel that they know all our weaknesses. They know all our moves. And yes, of course, you want to be in your heart. And of course, you want to talk, talk with compassion. Yet if Gandhi was dealing with Hitler, Gandhi wouldn't have been successful. So we're dealing with a situation here that's not quite Hitlerian. Well, we can already see the direction he's going. And so with that in mind, with the fears that I think all of us have if he is reelected, you're a really powerful guy. Yet, in addition to your encouragement, and so what you've said, what are your intentions in terms of engaged action? I, I ask you that question, you know why? Because I very rarely will have the opportunity as somebody who is a sensei who does walk the walk like he talks the talk, to ask that question, what about you? What are you going to do? Well, uh, and, and I ask that respectfully. You don't have to answer. No, 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 Jeff, I... I, 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 I I appreciate, but will reject the pedestal on what you just on what you just put me. Um, I'll repeat what I said earlier. I'm just another putz, and and labels sensei deplorable. It's the same thing, right? So I, mean, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, the other thing I would say to get back to, and I'm not sh I'm not sure that that someone's eavesdropping on this, but honestly, I don't care. I, I'd be happy to. It's going to be recorded. It it it, it will probably. I don't know whether it's going to be available publicly. I think, is it? Um, yeah, it is. So it's going to be available publicly. They don't even need to eavesdrop. <laughs> yeah, we'll hand it to them. <laughs> yeah. I th so to, 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 uh, to, I, I don't want to ever speak out loud what I don't want anybody else to hear. So I don't, there are no secrets, but guess what? What's our biggest defense if it's us and them? And I, I, I of course, reject that too, because there is no other team here. We're all the same team. But staying with that duality, um, they can't know what we're going to do because we don't know because we're operating with the three tenets. We don't know. <laughs> so what we talk about right now doesn't mean that that's what we're going to do the next time. I'm not avoiding your question. I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll step into that now. Um, three things. Most well, sadly, I'm only doing two. Um, one is I'm deeply involved in this group called Citizens Climate Lobbying, deeply involved in trying to shift the conversation specifically on the right side of the aisle in D.C. to get a national solution, a bipartisan national solution to climate. I'm absolutely convinced, and this is what I'll be talking about next week, I'm absolutely convinced it's got to be bipartisan or will not be sustainable, and we will defeat the purpose in which we're intending to Im Im implement the solution. The second thing is owning my white privilege, is owning my sad ignorance of the conditioning in which I've been walking until I recognized to a greater depth five or four months ago what it is to be white and what it is to start understanding what it might be if you're not white. And so I've been working, uh, we've been working here at ZPI to uh, create more uh, teachings and more, uh, more uh, engagement. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on a plunge into uh, around the questions of race and slavery and lynching and such. Uh, we're having more um, um, talks and teachings about that. And um, because I used to run in a, in a, in a, in a I, mean, I used to be somebody in the, in the corporate world, um, I've, I've, I'm very, I'm tickled to have been involved in 
putting uh, people of color on boards uh, because that's uh, woefully uh, uh, overdue. And um, so I'm owning that too. Um, but I do encourage people to vote. And then I guess there is a third thing. The third thing is this, is trying to get people to be engaged and to try to get people to see that we are the ones that are responsible for this divide that gives us such agenda. It's us. And we are the ones that can solve this problem. And we, to get to your reference to Gandhi and Hitler, we are fortunately in a very different situation from Gandhi. Uh, we, have, we have power. Gandhi had none. The British had it all. Uh, now, if Hitler had been in charge, had been the, the, the governor of, or whatever it was of, of India and had the ability to operate the way he wanted to, Gandhi's message, I think, still would have stopped Hitler because it was, a, it was, there were too many people and they were, they weren't yet rounded up. Um, but that's an opinion. I don't know. I mean, the Holocaust is something I've, I've been to Auschwitz on our, on our bearing witness retreats a couple of times and it's, it was powerful before I went and it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's one of those indescribable things too. Um, but we're not there. And I, I, I understand and I've heard the many analogies uh, that, that, of, of that and I respect those views, but we can do something about it. And, and, and we need to do something about it. And the best way we're gonna do that is by bridging this, not by being so certain about our view is the right and only view. We need to bring our one body closer together. And the best way I think to do that is to stay with the three tenets every moment.